intelligence as computational sophistication is much broader than uh, yes. than the, the the computational constraints which consciousness operates under, and also the sequential like the sequential thing. Yes, like right. the, the notion of time. That's that's kind of interesting. But then the, the the follow up question is like, okay, starting to get a sense of what is intelligence, and how does that connect to a human brain? Because you're saying. Um, intelligence is almost like a fabric like what we like plug into it or something like yeah i think uh, you know people our consciousness people, plugs into it yeah i mean the intelligence i think the core i mean you know intelligence at some level is just a word but we're asking you know what is the the notion of intelligence as we generalize it beyond the bounds of humans beyond the bounds of even the ais that we humans have built and so on you know what what is intelligence you know is the weather you know people say the weather has a mind of its own what does that mean you know can the weather be intelligent yeah you know, what does agency have to do with intelligence here so is intelligence just like your conception of computation just intelligence is a is the capacity to perform computation in a sea of yeah i think so i mean i think that's right and i i think that you know this question of of is it for a purpose, okay? Mm -hmm. That quickly degenerates into nice. a horrible philosophical mess because, you know, whenever you say, did the weather do that for a purpose? Yeah. Right? Well, yes, it did. It was trying to move a bunch of hot air from the equator to the poles or something. That's its purpose. But w why, because I, I seem to be equally as dumb today as I was yesterday. So there's some persistence, uh, like a uh, consistency over time that the intelligence I plugged into. So like what's, it seems like there's a hard constraint well, between the amount of computation I can perform in my consciousness. Like they seem to be really closely connected somehow. Well, I think the point is that the thing that gives you kind of the ability to have kind of conscious intel intelligence, you, you can have kind of this, okay. So, so one thing is we don't know intelligences other than the ones that are very much like us. Yes. Right? And the ones that are very much like us, I think, have this feature of single thread of time, bounded, you know, computationally bounded. Now, that, but you also need computational sophistication. Having a single thread of time and being computationally bounded, you could just be a clock going tick tock, you know, that would satisfy those conditions. But the fact that we have this uh, sort of uh, irreducible, uh, you know, computational ability, that's that's an important feature. That's that's the sort of the, the the bedrock on which we can construct the things we construct. Now, the fact that we have this experience of the world that has a single thread of time and computational boundedness, the thing that I sort of realized is it's that that causes us to deduce from this irreducible mess of what's going on in the physical world the laws of physics that we think exist. So in other words, if we say, why do we believe that there is you know, a continuous space, let's say? Why do we believe that gravity works the way it does? Mm -hmm. Well, in principle, we could be kind of parsing details of the universe that were, uh, you know, that involved, okay, the analogy is, uh, again, with uh, the you know, statistical mechanics and molecules in a box. We could be sensitive to every little detail of the swirling around of right. those molecules, and we could say what really matters is the you know the wiggle effect yes. that is um, you know that is something that we humans just never notice because it's yeah. some weird thing that happens when there are fifteen collisions of air molecules and this happens and that happens. We just see the pure motion of a ball yeah. moving about. Right. And Why do we see that? Right. And and the point is that that what seems to be the case is that. The things that, if, if we say, given this sort of hypergraph that's updating and all the details about all the sort of uh, sort of atoms of space and what they do, and we say, how do we slice that to what we can be sensitive to? What seems to be the case is that it, as soon as we assume, you know, computational boundedness, single thread of time, that leads us to general relativity. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can't avoid that. That that's the way that we we will parse the universe given those constraints. We parse the universe according to those particular, uh, in, in such a way that we say the aggregate reducible compu re sort of computa pocket of computational reducibility that we slice out of this kind of whole computationally irreducible ocean of behavior 
is just this one that corresponds to general relativity. Yeah, but we don't perceive general relativity. Well, we do if we do fancy experiments. So you're we, saying, so perceive really does mean the full- We drop something. That's a, that's a great example of general relativity in action, that gravity No, but works. like, what's the difference in that and Newtonian mechanics? I mean- what? Oh, it doesn't, I, th this is, I, when I say general relativity, that's you just mean gravity. The, uber, the uber theory, so to speak. Okay. Uh, I mean, Newtonian gravity is just the approximation that we can make, you know, n n on the earth and things like that. Okay. So, so this is, you know, the phenomenon of gravity is one that, is a consequence of, you know, we would perceive something very different from gravity. So, so the way to understand that is when we think about, okay, so we make up reference frames with which we parse what's happening in space and time. Mm -hmm. So in other words, one of, the, one of the things that we do is we say, as time progresses, uh, everywhere in space, is ha something happens at a particular time, and then we go to the next time, and we say, this is what space is like at the next time, this is what space is like at the next time. That's, it's the reason we are used to doing that is because, you know, when we look around, we might see, you know, 10, 100 meters away. Um, the time it takes light to travel that distance is really short compared to the time it takes our brains to know what happened. Mm -hmm. So as far as our brains are concerned, we are parsing the universe in this, there is a moment in time, it's all of space. There's a moment in time, it's all of space. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were the size of planets or something, we would have a different perception because the speed of light would be much more important to us. We wouldn't have this perception that uh, things happen progressively in time everywhere in space. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an important kind of constraint. And the reason that we kind of parse the universe in the way that causes us to say gravity works the way it does is because we're doing things like deciding that we can say the universe exists, space has a definite structure. Uh, there is a moment in time, space has this definite structure. We move to the next moment in time, space has another structure. Mm -hmm. That kind of setup is what lets us kind of deduce, kind of what to, to parse the universe in such a way that we say, Gravity works the way it does. So uh, that kind of reference frame is that the illusion of that is that you're saying that's somehow useful for consciousness. Like that's what consciousness does, because in a sense, what consciousness is doing is there are uh, it's it's insisting that the universe is kind of sequentialized. Right. That is. Um, and it, it is not allowing the possibility that, oh, there are these multiple threads of time and they're all flowing differently. It's like saying, no, you know, everything is happening in this one thread of experience that we have. And that illusion of that one thread of experience cannot happen at the planetary scale. So you're, are you saying typical human? Are you saying we are at a human level is special? here for consciousness like well for our kind of consciousness it's it's uh, you know if we existed at a scale close to the elementary length for example then our perception of the universe would be absurdly different okay so but this makes its consciousness seem like a weird side effect of this particular scale and so who cares i mean well, so yeah. consciousness is not that special i i, mean, I think uh, look i think that a very interesting question is which i've certainly thought a little bit about is what can you imagine what is a sort of factoring of something, you know, what are some other possible ways you could exist, so to speak? Right. And, you know, if you were a photon, if you were sort of, uh, you know, some kind of thing that was um, uh, kind of, you know, intelligence represented in terms of photons, mm -hmm. you know, for example, the photons we receive in the cosmic microwave background, mm -hmm. those photons, as far as they're concerned, the universe just started. Mm -hmm. they, they they were emitted, you know, 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe. They've been traveling at the speed of light. Time stayed still for them, and then they just arrived, and we just detected them. Mm -hmm. So for them, the universe just started, and that's a different perception of, you know, that has implications for a very different perception of time. They don't have that single thread that seems to be really important for being able to tell a heck of a good story. So we yes. humans yeah, tell we can tell a story. We can, <laughs> right, we can so, tell a story. And we, what other uh, kind of stories can you tell? So photon is a really boring story. Or, yeah, I mean, so, no. so that's a, I don't know if they're a boring story, but I, I think it's, you know, I've been wondering about this and I've been asking, you know, friends of mine who are science fiction writers and things, have you written stuff about this? And I've got one example, mm -hmm. great, great uh, collection of books from my friend Rudy Rucker, which were, um, uh, which I have to say, the um, the books about uh, that are very informed by a bunch of science that I've done, and the thing that I really loved about them is you know 
you know, in the in the first chapter of the, of the book, the the Earth is consumed by these things he called nants, which are nano nanobot type things. And nice. it, 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 um, but it, so you know, so the Earth is gone in the first, but then it comes back. But but um, but then spoiler alert. Yeah, right. That was a that was only a micro spoiler. It's only chapter one. Okay, good. It's it's um the but but uh, the thing that um is is not a real spoiler alert because it's such a complicated concept. But but in the end, in the end. The the Earth is saved by this thing called the principle of computational equivalence, which is a kind of a, a core scientific idea of mine. And I was just like like thrilled. I, I don't read fiction books very often, um, and I was just thrilled. I get to the end of this, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, everything is saved by this sort of deep scientific principle.